The Trudeau government has embarked on an era of asset recycling to develop and bankroll infrastructure projects in Canada. These moves could involve leasing or selling stakes in major public assets such as highways, ports and airports. However, it requires the cooperation of provincial and municipal governments along with the federal government. For more insight on the challenges facing this rather ambitious plan, I'm joined by former Ontario Deputy Minister Michael Fenn. Good to have you here, Michael. You're also on the board of OMERS, but I know you don't speak for OMERS. Um, I'm curious now that we have the broad strokes of pieces of infrastructure, types of infrastructure, bridges, roads, highways, and so on, to move into specific actual utility companies or toll roads. You know Ontario very well. What sort of projects might be up for grabs? Well, I think uh, if you look at the kinds of infrastructure deficit uh, items that we have, it's, it's uh, utilities, it's uh, uh, transportation facilities, it uh, involves ports and airports on the federal level, and uh, about 60% of infrastructure is in the municipal and local government field, so it's water and wastewater systems, uh, uh, electricity distribution, all those kinds of activities. The, the institutional investors, pension funds, large investors that would come on board to, to help bankroll some of these, to buy some of these assets, would be looking for scale. They've said that repetitively. They're, they're not going to go and buy a very small bridge. They want a very large bridge that they can charge money on and so on. When you look at a city like Toronto or Vancouver or whatever, you can understand how um, an investor might want to buy the wastewater program for a large city. But how would it work? How do you bundle assets for, say, parts of eastern Ontario. How, how would something like that work? Because well, there, there is no scale in one small town. Well, that's a really good observation. Uh, if you look at some of the things that have been done like that, like in eastern Ontario, they developed a broadband infrastructure for all the communities in eastern Ontario. The municipal leaders got together and did them on a pooled basis. If you look at what they did, say, in the state of Missouri, they had a whole lot of bridges across all their counties that were in a bad state of repair, and they brought them all up to standard in one multi-year um, uh, combined program where the contractors all had a piece of the action, but it was one big P3 initiative uh, funded uh, on, a, on a time-limited basis using standard approaches, uh, looking at ways in which they can do th uh, have the synergies of the private sector being involved in terms of delivering things on time and on budget and things of that kind. Will that be the goal, do you think, for, for again, smaller scale but still need the work done? Well, it's, it's early days. The, the, if you look at the economic statement, uh, there are elements in that that need to be fleshed out. Uh, you're correct that uh, major pools of capital like to have a minimum threshold if they're going to do all the due diligence that's involved. So uh, the challenge is going to be either to d identify projects that are sufficiently large that justifies the investment or ways to bundle them together so that they can have in aggregate the kind of uh, price tag that will justify the, the investment of private capital. Once some of these assets become uh, bought by a company and are, are creating revenue, they can then be taxed also by the government, which right. is sort of another piece of it. Um, how, how much might that provide? I mean, in broad strokes, is that an important piece of this? Well, there's been some interesting work done by, uh, sponsored by the Residential and Civil Construction Alliance in Ontario that says that investments in infrastructure pay a net uh, fiscal premium, particularly to the Government of Canada. So the, there is a return that comes from, uh, from that activity. The, the other side of it is, of course, that it creates uh, um, uh, higher levels of productivity and increased economic activity and that in turn has a, a beneficial effect in terms of creating employment and creating uh, economic activity that can be taxed. The other thing is of course as you say uh, some things that are currently in the public sector that don't need to be or can be partially in, uh, shared between the public and private sector we've had experience with that they do become tax-paying entities so they can start making a contribution back to the uh, both to their investors or their pensioners or whoever they're dealing with as well as to uh, the fiscal Plan. There is a, a focus certainly of foreign direct investment allowing big institutional players globally into these projects of scale that might be of interest to right. their portfolios. Which foreign direct investors are we not open to? I, I'm thinking of sovereign wealth funds, I'm thinking of, of other potentially politically uh, contentious investors. I, I think you need to look at the experience of other jurisdictions. If you look at Australia, for example, they've had. Will we be following that model quite closely? Do you I, think? I think that well, the Australian experience with asset recycling is very positive. They have uh, real cooperation with the municipal, provincial, well, their provincial and federal. And they've projects. done it by uh, providing incentives uh, to to the local governments and to the state governments to uh, get into asset recycling. They don't just do it. Uh, 
a holus bolus. They do it because they're provided incentives by the Commonwealth Government of Australia. But they have done yeah, a number of, uh, of P3 infrastructure projects where they have a number of foreign investors. Sometimes they're, uh, and that's true of some of the Canadian investment pension funds, for example, they partner up with Australian funds and with funds from other jurisdictions. The Australians have, though, run a uh, screen to look at who's going to be investing and who, what their uh, provenance is, and, uh, and so they will, and they have uh, uh, turned down some proposals on the basis that they don't like the way they're structured or who's involved and so forth. If you go for a drive in the U.S., there's toll roads everywhere. Mm. It's very normal. Um, this country is, is the exact opposite. We have one very, very um, profitable one. How many toll roads will we see here in 10 years? Just just throw out a, a number or, or guess even. Well, I, th I think the way that uh, is best framed is we're going to see a lot more infrastructure where people pay the full cost of the infrastructure, the full lifetime cost. It's not just toll roads. It could be bridges and, right. and tunnels. It could be uh, wastewater systems, like you mentioned. It could, there's a variety of places where we're not likely paying the full value of the infrastructure, and that's why we end up with uh, deferred maintenance and infrastructure deficits. Right. And potentially nuclear as well. Well, of course, we're, uh, we're heavily involved heavily. in nuclear already. In fact, that's a good illustration that this is uh, potentially something that uh, uh, brings out the best in both the private sector and the public sector. Uh, the, the, certainly the nuclear industry is doing a lot to help us uh, uh, ensure that Ontario has the power it needs going forward and it's a safe and uh, environmentally sustainable uh, model. Good to speak with you. Thank you. Thank you for the invitation.